Well, hello, hello, friends. This is Nate, your host and instructor for Beekeeping 101, the crash course. Today is lesson two. I'm really excited. I had a great time uh, with lesson one. I hope y'all did too. It was a little bit long-winded though, so I'm going to try to keep this one a little shorter. Um, but today we're going to talk about care and management. In this lesson, we're going to talk about how to start a colony. We're going to look at what a routine checkup looks like, and um, that's actually a little bit of a misnomer here. I'm going to include a part two, which will be a separate video of a hive checkup, um, because right now it's the fall. It's really not a good time to be cracking open bees, so uh, my brother Paul has offered to graciously provide some video footage of a hive checkup uh, for the educational purposes of this class. So I'm going to put that link in the description below if you're watching this on YouTube. If you're watching this live, then just uh, bear with me and I'll, I'll get it to you after the class is over, uh, after this lesson is over. We'll also talk about pests and diseases that you need to know about. Lastly, we'll put the uh, we'll put your apiary in perspective, look at where your hives should be placed for your sake, for your neighbor's sake, for your kid's sake, and for your bee's sake. Um, but when you start a colony, there's a, there's a lot that goes on between the five pound package and getting to this point right here where you have a beautiful hive full of bees and the first preseason prep homework that you need to be doing is checking with your local county extension office about any registration requirements or mu municipal restrictions that your city might have on, on beekeeping. Because there are some cities that have limits on, on keeping bees within this, the neighborhoods. I mean, even some homeowners associations may not, may not allow it. So do your homework, find out what your local area requires, see if they have anything. Uh, it's, it's infrequent that they do have any restrictions, but still, you don't wanna be caught, end on the, caught on the wrong end of that stick if there are restrictions and somebody finds out you have bees in your backyard. So do your homework. A big part of you doing your homework is finding a local bee club. And I highly recommend this. These people will be your local experts and they'll help make they'll help make sure that you succeed. That's how I got started. I joined the Williamson County Area Beekeepers Association. Uh, I got a their, I earned their scholarship. I was a young person, uh, uh, wrote an essay. I, won their scholarship and it included a free hive of bees, a tutor, all the equipment, and that's uh, the rest is history. Um, great way to start. That's where your local resources will be. Besides relying on YouTube and on the internet, it's really important to have a live warm body next to you when you're learning to keep bees. Another part of your homework, you need to look over where you want to order your bees and this needs to happen in the fall. Right now, bees are flying off the shelves because COVID has kind of forced people to find different hobbies, and the supplier that I'm buying from is actually running out of bees a lot faster than what I'm used to. So I had to order pretty early. They still have hives available. Uh, the supplier I, I trust is Sweet Mountain Honey in Georgia. They've, they've done a good job of delivering quality genetics, and I, I've liked their bees. I like them in a lot. Another plus, let's go on back to the bee club real quick. Another plus of joining the bee club is that you can probably buy hives with the club and get bulk discounts or on shipping. Lastly, and we'll talk about this in at the end of this lesson, prep your apiary site. Find a good place where you're going to keep your bees and get it ready. When your bees do arrive, this will be your installation. It's probably going to be in March or May. Your bees here, it'll be super exciting. They're going to come in this little five pound package, the mass of bees in a box. And I would encourage you to block out that weekend when you know they're coming. The shipper will usually tell you when they're going to arrive. They should. A good shipper will do that. And they're going to need to go into their home immediately. So block out that weekend, set aside the time to make sure that you can get them into their home as soon as they arrive. So don't sugar to get started. Once they are in their home, feed them one-to-one -one sugar water immediately to help them get established. And we talked about this in the last lesson, but one-to-one -one sugar water is just one part water to one part sugar. It's a light syrup and this stimulates their wax production. Plus quick, easy carbs to help them get up and going. As far as installing the package, uh, a little bit out of order here. 
when you install the package, we will go over how to install a package of fees in lesson five. So stay tuned for that. That's going to be the last lesson we have, lesson five. When you do install your bees and you close them up, don't peek. It's going to be like putting rolls or, or a nice bread, artisan bread in the oven. If you open up that oven and peek in there continuously, it's not going to rise. It's going to be flat. Same idea with your beehive. Once you put them in there, leave them be. If you continually open up their hive, that disturbance will prohibit them from establishing correctly. You might accidentally squish the queen and you'll have basically crippled them from the start. So wait at least a week before you open them up, check and make sure that their queen has gotten out of the cage successfully and remove that old queen cage. This, uh, this is an important because sometimes one of the nurse bees that's in that cage with her might die and they'll fall in the opening of the hole that, that lets the queen out and it'll prohibit her from escaping into the hive so that way she can start laying eggs. You just need to get in there in about a week and make sure that she's made it out successfully and that's all you need to do. Don't don't try to go overboard and check the whole thing. Keep it as non-invasive as possible because they're still getting established and they need their space. Some of the pests that you need to be looking for are varroa mites, which is this little bugger right here, hive beetles, and wax moth. And these are really the three musketeers that you're going to run across continually and have to be managing for all the time. With the varroa mite, when you're treating it, there's three ways that you can go about it or actually four, the way that most large-scale beekeepers go about it is chemically, treating them chemically. I, I don't recommend it for obvious reasons. I prefer to go the integrative pest management route, which is where you can use powdered sugar to dust your bees down, and that powdered sugar causes the mites to slip off more easily and fall down to the bottom of your hive. Now, the important thing here is that you have to have a screen bottom board with that treatment method. And that's the second second way that you can control mites, is having a screen bottom board. So when your mites do fall off, either from you powdering your bees with powdered sugar, or just accidentally, they fall through that screen and down to the ground where they can't get back up onto the bees. So two methods, powdered sugar, screen bottom board, and the last method is to freeze your drone brood. Freeze your drone brood. That's right. So last lesson, we talked about the three kinds of bees, there's the queen, the worker, and the drone. And they actually have different cell types. The drone, because he's a guy and he's bigger, has a bigger cell, not as big as the queen, but it's bigger. So us beekeepers have actually manufactured a specific foundation with larger cells that the queen will only lay drone brood in. And you take that special frame with the larger foundation, you put it in your hive, the bees build it out with drone-sized cells, the queen only puts drones in it, and then the varroa mite, as part of their life cycle, breeds in those drone cells, in that drone brood. So once you have a fully capped frame of drone brood, take it out and freeze it. And this disrupts the next generation of, hi of mites that are coming into your beehive via their reproduction in those same cells because you're freezing them out and you're killing them. So those are three ways that you can effectively control the varroa mite. It's important to control them because they're basically fleas. They're fleas for bees. They suck the life juices out of the bee and they weaken your hive, making it susceptible to some of these other pests and diseases that we're about to talk about. So that's the varroa mite. The hive beetle this comes in two sizes, the small hive beetle and the large hive beetle. I know, really creative. But these guys can do a lot of damage no matter what size they are. And their damage comes mainly in their larval stage. So these beetles will lay eggs in your comb as those eggs mature and become larvae or maggots is more what they look like. They eat through the wax and the pollen and the honey and leave a nasty slimy trail behind them. And it destroys a hive. So there's good reason to try to control these guys. And there's a few ways that you can do it. Uh, again, it's integrative pest management. That's that's the only way that I, I talk about because it's the only way that I like to go. Um, but you can put oil traps in your hive. That's one way to do it. It's these little plastic troughs with oil in the bottom and little bitty hidey holes in the top. And those beady, beetles will go hide in those holes and slip and fall into the oil and drown. So that's one way you can control their population. Another way is to take advantage of their natural reproductive life cycle. So like the mites, 
they have a weak spot where they're most vulnerable. And that is when their larva have to pupate. So once they've gone through your wax and made a terrible mess, they go into the ground beneath the hive and pupate there, turn into a beetle, and then fly back into the hive to do the same thing over again. This is where you can put a special beetle, it's, it's kind of like a, a beetle excluder entrance at the front of your hive. So the bees can get in, but the beetles can't. So if you can stop them at the door, keep them from getting in the hive, that's a good thing. That's a way that you can control them. But you will still have to battle them. Just keep an eye on their numbers. I kind of do, uh, whenever I'm checking a hive, I've, I've gotten really good at just squashing them on site. That's that's another way. It's not really, doesn't really have a high efficacy rate, but boy, it makes you feel good. The last one we're going to talk about is the wax moth. Again, hives that are weak are going to be susceptible to these pests because weak hives do not guard or clean as well as a strong hive does. Good bees have good hygienic practices. It's just in their nature and in their genetics actually a lot. We'll talk about that later. But hives that are weak are not cleaning as well. They're going to struggle with this wax moth um, and the rest of the pests because they're not able to eject the larva and the debris and the feces and the webbing and everything else in a timely manner. And so it just builds up and builds up and destroys the hive. Uh, but back to the wax moth. The wax moth lays eggs in the comb. Those eggs turn into larvae, like you can see here. And those larvae drag themselves around and eat holes through the comb and eat the pollen and the honey and leave this really nasty webbing behind. Uh, it's full of larva poop and all sorts of other debris. So they make a royal mess of the hive. Uh, the best way to treat for them is to have a strong beehive. Uh, feed your bees that are struggling. This will help keep their strength up, get their numbers up, uh, requeen them for better genetics. Genetics so the bees that have better cleaning tendencies because believe it or not you can breed for that. We'll talk about that more later because that's that's another remedy that you can use even for some of our diseases. Before I get into the specific diseases though, let's talk about biosecurity. All right, last week we learned that a beehive is an aseptic environment, meaning they've got so much antibiotic propolis in there just coating it that it basically makes the beehive a, a sterile environment free of free of diseases but we still struggle with diseases so how how is how does disease invade a sterile environment like a beehive well there's two main ways first of all through robbing and i'm not talking about somebody coming into your backyard and robbing your beehives of their honey i'm talking about bees robbing bees because it happens and it makes sense. You know, if you have to spend so much energy, like 200 trips to a single flower to make one drop of honey, then heck, why not go to a weaker hive and just steal their honey? Let them do all the work and take their honey and bring it back to your hive and put it in your cell. Well, the only problem with that is that that weak hive is usually weak for a reason. If they're sick with, with a disease, a lot of times it's from bacteria or fungus that has spores or is present in that nectar. So a strong hive goes and robs a weak hive and brings back that disease to their hive and then they get infected. And gradually as they increase that amount of bacteria and fungus or whatever it is, they become ill with it too. So robbing. Robbing is one way that disease enters your hives and actually compromises that sterile environment. The way that you can fight robbing is by reducing the entrances to your beehives. Beehives have, like we talked about last week, as that worker bee matures, she graduates to different tasks. Well, one of those tasks is a guard bee, and she sits at the entrance and keeps any invaders or other bees from other hives from coming in. Well, if she has a giant area to protect, it's, it's kind of like capture the flag. The longer that line is, uh, of the boundary between the two teams, the harder it is to keep somebody from crossing that line. So reduce the size of your entrance to be one or two bees or three bees. So, so that, that guard bee, if, if she's only one, if there's only one guard bee, she can do a better job of keeping invaders out of that hive. Secondly, feed 
inside the hives rather than allowing communal feeding at a single sugar water reservoir outside of the hives. Some beekeepers will put uh, a sugar water reservoir in their apiary just to let all the bees in the whole apiary drink from the same reservoir. This is kind of like putting a uh, water fountain in a public place where in order to get a drink you have to put your mouth on the spigot. So not good, not really good hygiene there. All right, all your bees coming to one location to drink and share the same pool of food is a great way for diseases to to cross in that community. So instead of feeding in a communal reservoir, feed directly into the hive with a Boardman feeder or a hive top feeder, something that's not going to be easily robbed or shared with other bees. All right, you want to keep it specific to that hive. So robbing. Robbing is how diseases make it into hives. The second biggest factor is you, us, as the beekeepers. Oftentimes we have poor biosecurity measures and that compromises hive health. Whenever you go in between hives, the propolis on your gloves, the wax on your gloves, the, the honey or the, uh, the, the bee bread, the pollen, is carrying with it whatever spores and whatever diseases were in the previous hive. So here's some rules of thumb that I want you to be practicing. These are good biosecurity practices. You need to scorch, and I mean torch, any used bee boxes that you get from other apiaries before you put them in your apiary. Now, with the exception of American fowl brood, a good scorching will generally clear up any bacteria or spores that are living in the wood of a used bee box that you might have bought from somebody else. I would caution against it, though, because unless you're really thorough, it's hard to get every nook and cranny in a beehive thoroughly sterilized. So I would advise to just go ahead and make your own equipment fresh instead of buying used. But if you're going to buy used, be thorough. You can also use heat to sterilize your gloves, your hive tool, and any other equipment that were used in the weaker diseased hive. Believe it or not, you can actually use your smoker for this. Uh, the only caveat there, it, I, let me back up. A smoker is, uh, is one of the tools in your beekeeping toolkit. It's a little cylinder with a chimney on top. You build a fire in the cylinder and the smoke comes out the chimney and there's a, a pair of bellows on the cylinder too. And you can puff smoke into a beehive and it helps calm them down. It aids in management we'll, we'll, in the hive check. We'll talk about that more later in the essential tools portion, which is actually lesson three. But anyways, you can get the fire so hot in that smoker that you can make it a flamethrower and it's, it's really cool. It's really fun, but um, it will sterilize your equipment if you, you can use your smoker to torch your equipment that way. But you just have to be careful because if it's hot enough to sterilize your equipment, it's also hot enough to kill your bees. So if you're sterilizing your equipment with it, make sure it's nice and cool before you start smoking your bees with that same smoker. All right, don't transfer frames from weak hives to strong hives to be cleaned. Instead, use strong hives to boost the weak hives. All right, remember, weak hives are weak for a reason. You don't want to take whatever their problem is and add it to whatever the strong hives is already having to deal with. Yeah, they're stronger and they could probably conquer it, but why take that risk? That's a $400, $300, $400 asset that you have there, and you're willing, willfully introducing potential disease and infection to them. That, that just doesn't make sense. Do the opposite and take frames from strong hives and put them in weak hives to help those weak hives get a boost. Maybe start a new queen. Uh, maybe have some new brood to introduce better, uh, some more worker bees in there, some more nurse bees to do some more cleaning. That's that's a better idea. But don't, don't do the opposite and put weak hive frames in strong hives. That's just asking for trouble. Another thing, cycle out old comb every three to four years. That wax absorbs chemicals, bacteria, spores, and over time it can retain a really nasty cocktail of pesticide residues brought in on the feet of bees and pollen from the area. So cycle it out. Also, requeen. When hives are weak and you're feeding them and doing everything you can for them, but they're not rebounding within a couple of weeks, you need to go ahead and cull the queen. That's usually an indicator, indicator that your queen has some poor genetics. It's not performing well. And uh, although it's really going to hurt to squash that $20 bug, you need to do it. Culling is always painful, but absolutely necessary. So think long and hard about it, but do it. 
requeen with genetics from a reputable apiary, or allow natural requeening. Sometimes there's adequate genetics in the area that, uh, that you can requeen with and let your hive naturally requeen itself. Reduce unnecessary interventions. All right, checking your hives and moving frames really disrupts the hive life and it opens up the hive to robbing and beekeeper error, error and disrupts the carefully controlled internal hive conditions. Lastly, place your apiary appropriately. And we'll talk about that at the end of this lesson. So let's dive into these diseases. We still got a lot of ground to cover. This is American foul brood. What you're looking at right here is the liquefied remains of what was a baby bee. American foul brood is a spore forming bacteria that infects young larvae via spores that are transferred from the nurse bee to the young bees through feeding. I bring this up first because American foul brood is one of the most serious leth and lethal infectious diseases. It's no longer common, but it has to be on your radar because it's, it's, it's not common because of the steps that beekeepers have taken to eradicate it. And those steps have come at a high, high price for us. So this is something we need to be aware of and prepared to pay the price for our, ourselves as well. And we'll talk about that in a second after we talk about symptoms. So American foul brood looks like this. If you look at the brood, the cappings are going to be suction sunken and punctured uh, because the larvae beneath it have dried up and, and been desiccated. The larva will be black or brown and that dead larva will dry up so hard as a black mass in the bottom of the cell that the, the scale that it becomes will be almost immovable. You, you won't be able to get it out. It'll be adhered to that cell pretty hard. And that's, that's a key indicator of American foul brood. Secondly, another symptom of American foul brood is that it will, we call it the rope test, and that's what this picture is demonstrating here. But if you stick a toothpick or a matchstick or a twig down into that cell, swish it around a little bit, and pull it out slowly, that liquefied larva will stretch like a rope three to five centimeters. All right, and that's important because the kissing cousin that we're going to talk about next, European foul brood, you can do the same rope test to it, but it'll only stretch out one to two centimeters. All right, so small details, but the devil is in the details, is he not? Lastly, but not least, the hive will have a sulfur-like smell, hence the name foul brood. When you open it up, you'll probably be able to smell that, that, rotting, uh, that rotting brood. When you treat the hive, in order to treat this, this is why it's such a high cost, there's really no way to get rid of it. You have to seal off the hive and burn it. That's the price that we've paid in order to make it a rare, um, thankfully, less common disease here in the States. We burned a lot of hives. Um, that's a high price to pay but it's so infectious that if you do not, you are not only risking the rest of your apiary, you are also risking the rest of the hives in your state. Because as your hives become weaker, other beehives will come and rob them. They'll take that nectar that's filled with the American foul brood spores. They'll take it home to their hives and those hives will become infected. Then they'll become weak and then they'll get robbed and it'll just spread on down the line to the rest of the, the beekeepers in the state. So when you know that you have American foul brood, Report it to your local apiary inspector, your state apiary inspector, who will advise you, advise you on what to do. Seal off that hive immediately, and you're going to have to burn it. So just prepare yourself mentally for that. It's, uh, it's a tall order, but you, you, you have to do it. Um, and the reason is because if a hive is infected with American foul brood, the spores can live on in the equipment in a hive for decades. So it's, it's no joke. Thankfully, uh, there's a less, or not thankfully, I mean, it's still a disease, but European foul brood is the close cousin of American foul brood. Uh, there's a few key differences, though. It is more common, but it's less lethal, and it, and it has less staying power because it's a non-spore-forming bacteria. It competes with the young larva for fruit, for food in the young larva's gut. So it basically starves that larva to death. It's also transferred from the nurse bees to the young bees through feeding. 
This one, though, is a stress-related disease that typically strikes hives that are weak or significantly disturbed. And although it's infectious, there are no spores. So a strong hive can clean the bacteria from the hive with their hygienic routines. By the way, this, this picture is courtesy of Rob Snyder from www.beinformed.org. Thanks, Rob. The larvae down in the cells, you can see they're turning yellow and brown. What they're going to do is, is they continue to dry out. They'll turn into a scale, kind of like the American fowl brood uh, does, but the scale is going to be loose. Also, another key difference between European fowl brood and American fowl brood is, besides the rope test, is that American fowl brood will primarily infect capped brood, whereas European fowl brood will primarily infect uncapped larvae. So keep that difference in mind. Uh, some other symptoms you're going to look for is a shotgun appearance in the brood pattern. The brood is going to be very spotty with a lot of open cells, and you'll see those yellowing or brown larvae in them. That dead larva will dry up and adhere to the bottom of the cell as a loosely adhered brown or black scale. So in order to treat this, let's go back and remember that it's, a, it's an opportunist disease. It waits for times of stress in the hive to really uh, show up and grow in strength. And it only occurs during that time because when the bees are stressed, they're not as good as they're not as good at keeping their hive clean. Their hygienic behavior is uh, compromised, and so they're not cleaning up that the the cells as well. So when you're treating it, remove the queen so that way a break in the brood cycle allows the cells to be sufficiently cleaned of the bacteria. You can also replace that queen with a more hygienic breed. Again, a lot of this is determined by the genetics of your queen. If your hive is struggling and if you're doing everything you can to help it and it's still not doing well, you might want to look at your queen. She might be responsible. Her genetics might not be, uh, might not be up to snuff with what your beehive needs to survive. But what you need to know for American fowl bird is that if you allow your hive and, and boost them up to the proper strength so that way they can do the cleaning that they need to get rid of this, they can and they will get rid of European fowl bird. Last but not least, let's talk about chalk brood. This one's not as lethal. It's just a fungus, fungus that strikes during prolonged cool and wet weather. It's definitely a secondary disease that uh, strikes weak hives. It usually hits in the spring when those conditions are at their peak, and it can be eliminated over time by a healthy hive. The symptoms, and you'll see it in the bottom of these cells here, are white or gray mummies in the brood cells. Basically, that fungus infects the brood. The mycelium is white or gray, and it fills up that cell and, and makes that little mummy that you're seeing in there. When there's enough, the frame will actually rattle when shaken just from the mummified brood shaking around in their cap cells. So the, that's, that, that's an interesting thing. If you shake the, the frame, you'll actually hear those little mummies rattling around in their cells. Lastly, if you look at the front entrance and down on the ground, you'll see the mummies laying in the grass and on, on the front porch because the bees, as they're cleaning out, will just throw them out the front door. Uh, and that's another way to tell that you have chalk brood. So in order to treat it, just give it time. This disease is usually due to cold and damp conditions, and it will disappear as the hive gets stronger and is better able to regulate internal temperatures and humidity and keep up with housekeeping. For hives that struggle with severe chalk brood regularly, replace the queen with a more hygienic breed. That's the uh, pests and diseases. Let's talk about hive placement, which plays a part in the health of your hive. But I want to look at this from three different angles. you got to take yourself into consideration, besides taking your bees into consideration when you place your hive. And you also need to take your neighbors, your kids, and your livestock into consideration when placing your hive. So first, let's talk about you. When you put your hive out there in the apiary, put it up on cinder blocks or some raised stands for ease of checking. This uh, picture that we have is of my apiary back when uh, I was a young stud muffin. And uh, bricks is what we had on hand, so that's just what we used. When you're putting them out there, think about the ergonomics of it. Think about how far you want to lift your bees, how far you're capable to lift your bees. If you put them up too high, your beehive could become so tall that the supers on top are hard to reach. If you put it down too low, you'll be, your back will be sore after checking your apiary 
because you've been bending over the whole time. So think about how you want to set it up, what height that needs to be in order for you to be comfortable and to lift it ergonomically. Secondly, mind the gap. Keep the hives far enough apart to allow room for checking. Cramped beekeeping is no fun. I have my hives in this picture pretty far apart, um, but you don't have to do it that way. You can actually line them up in a row and you still have access to the back or to the front of them. So that would allow you some space to put the frames on the ground like I have here, or put the lid off to the side, or maybe put a super on the neighboring hive. You just need space. It's like a kitchen counter. It's hard to cook if you don't have enough space. You wanna allow yourself space. This shouldn't be stressful. Secondly, or thirdly, point the entrance away from human pathways and activity, because that's their landing strip. The bees are gonna be going in and out of there. You don't want them um, flying in front of your doorway or in front of your dog's doghouse or in front of your kid's play area. Just keep in mind that they'll uh, make a diagonal straight shot for that entrance and, and you don't want any passerby to be walking in that flight zone. The considerations for your bees, this is what you need to think about. Primarily think about your climate. All right, Northern states, they get a lot colder and you need to protect the hives from wind and place for exposure to full sun. They're gonna need that extra heat. But if you're in the south, it's the opposite. Place your hives for exposure to the morning sun, so that way it's a good, it's a little alarm clock and warms them up early, especially on uh, some of these colder mornings that we have during the fall and winter, it helps wake them up earlier. But they need to have protection from that glaring afternoon sun. Also, have water easily accessible. If you don't provide water to your bees, they're going to go get it from somewhere else. And a lot of times that's your neighbor's pool or your neighbor's dog bowl. And you can bet you're going to hear about it if they have so many bees on their pool that they can't jump in. So provide water for your bees. Also keep the hives off the ground and away from damp, low laying areas without good air movement. The last thing you want is your hive sitting in a low, stagnant area that's damp and ripe with fungus and mold. All right, don't put them in an airstream. Put them where the air is moving at least and, and give them some height off the ground so that way uh, the, the screen bottom board can allow for some ventilation there. Lastly, keep them in an area where you don't have to mow around them very much. Loud mowing and edging can agitate your bees. If you have to mow, if, if you're keeping your bees in your backyard and you don't really have much of a choice about keeping them where the grass uh, needs to be mowed, just put on a throw on a bee veil when you're mowing or and, and make sure that you're purchasing Italian bees. That's the most docile breed that you can get. Uh, I haven't had a problem with Italian bees mowing around them except for on cloudy days and that's, that's generally when their uh, mood is dampened anyways. So just keep that in mind. Get some docile bees and wear your, your veil when you need to mow around your hives or just put them where you don't have to mow. So those are things to take into consideration for the sake of the bees when you're placing your hive. Last but not least, these are things you need to consider in placement of your hives for your neighbor's sake or for your livestock's sake or for your kid's sake. And I think Robert Frost summed it up pretty well in his quote, good fences make good neighbors. With livestock, put a fence around your apiary. It doesn't have to be a privacy fence. It can be a simple, pretty stout, or it could be an electric fence. Just something to keep the cows from rubbing up on the beehives and pushing them over because they're trying to scratch an itch. Because those bees will get mad and they will sting your cow. And um, this is important because we had a really awful incident where our neighbor tied his horse up against the fence where our apiary was and his horse reeked and that smell agitates it's it's strong odors that are strong offensive odors they they do upset the bees and will make them more defensive and our bees ended up stinging his horse to death it was awful um we we reimbursed him for the horse moved our hives away from the fence uh it, it was just a bad experience and i wouldn't wish that on anybody but that is a lesson learned. Do not tie your livestock or put them in pens where they cannot escape from your bees. 
All right, your bees are not going to just go hunt down somebody to sting because they're on the war path and they feel like stinging somebody. They've only got one sting to give and they're only going to put it towards defending their hive. So if they feel threatened or antagonized, they're going to use it. So don't pin up your livestock against the beehives where the livestock can't escape. Strong offensive odors do upset the bees and will make them more defensive. So if you've got a billy goat who's doing his thing all over his beard and he smells like you know what, then don't put him near your beehive. Put a fence up around their bees. Livestock are generally smart enough to go the other direction when uh, a bee stings them once. They don't wait to get stung to death unless they're constrained and, and tied up against that hive. Place your beehives with their entrances facing a solid fence to force their flight path to go upward and away from human activity. So say you don't have livestock, but you do have neighbors and you're uh, beekeeping in your backyard. Face that hive up against your privacy fence so that way they're forced to go straight up. This will keep them from bonking into your neighbors or flying at a low, a low level and potentially running into you or your kids as you're going about your daily activities. Honeybees really do mind their own business and they do not willfully go looking for someone to sting unless they're provoked. Alright, now for your kids, I want you to do this. This is a learning opportunity, not, not the stinging part, the, the bees. It's an incredible educational experience. I want you to take the time to educate and involve your kids in the process of beekeeping so they can be inspired and have a healthy respect for these insects without having to have a traumatizing stinging experience. All right, being stung as a kid is no fun. People remember that. Um, get your kids involved so that way they can see what it is early on and from the protection of a bee veil and a bee suit. Uh, where they can experience the wonder and the joy of discovery as they peer into this incredible, incredible complex organism. All right, let it be a let it be something that's really cool for them and not something that's a source of fear where they don't want to go in the backyard anymore. Also, go with Italian bees. That's the only way to go if you've got kids running around the backyard. They're the most docile breed. I would also recommend that you purchase a good. Uh, instant sting relief ointment and I, I recommend sting ease I think it's rebranded now I'll, I'll include a link in the description um, but I have that on hand in case any of my my kids get stung um, but as far as the neighbors go a good way to placate them and get them in the, get yourself in their good graces is to take them honey every year uh, these are all things that you need to take into consideration when you're placing your beehive it's for the health of your hive, it's for your health, and it's for the health of your kids and your neighbors and your livestock. You can put your hive in your backyard and have a healthy relationship with everybody around you without having to irritate anybody. So recap, let's finish this up. When starting your apiary, do your homework on local restrictions and join a bee club. Honeybees are susceptible to a variety of pests and diseases. Your best defense is a good offense you need to be managing proactively for these diseases. And you need to also understand that a weak hive is one that's most susceptible to all these different pests. A lot of times, a strong hive, the hygienic practices that they have, will really keep them free of, of most of the problems you can encounter. For a hive checkup demonstration, see the link to part two of this lesson. I'll include it in the link, uh, excuse me, in the description of this video when I, when I post it on YouTube. You'll get to watch uh, a live hive checkup from some of the pros. It'll be pretty cool. Lastly, hive placement has a lot to do with making sure everyone's personal space is respected, including your neighbors. That's all, folks. Lesson three will be next, where we'll talk about tools of the trade. And we're not going to do it next week. We're going to take a break for Thanksgiving. I hope that you all have a wonderful Thanksgiving with your families. I'm going to take Thanksgiving off to be with my family. So we'll pick up lesson three on December 5th. Be looking for it. We'll talk about hive components, specifically the components of a Langstroth hive. We'll also talk about hive types because there are a lot of types of hives out there from the observation hive to the top bar hive to the war a hive to the Langstroth hive to you name it. Lastly, we'll talk about essential tools because there are also a lot of tools out there that you don't necessarily need. I'd like to save you the time and trouble of discovering which ones you don't need and go ahead and just tell you which ones you absolutely must have and which ones you don't. 
I really appreciate y'all watching. If you enjoyed this, please like and subscribe. Post your questions to Exley Apiary on Facebook. Comment, like, and subscribe for more. And as always, if you have questions, feel free to reach out.